There is a family who is leaving their country to come to the United States early in the last century. And they took all their money and they bought this ticket on the boat to come over to our country. All they had left was a nickel and a chunk of cheese. And so they were living on this chunk of cheese for more than a week. And finally they began to get hungry. And the father sent the son out and he said, take this nickel and go and buy us some food, but don't squander it. Make sure you get enough food for all of us to last the next few days. And then he went out on his way. And having not returned for an hour and then two hours, the father became worried that someone might have taken the nickel from him and who knows what they did to him. So he went out searching for him. And he passed by this banquet hall, tables filled with all kinds of food and people enjoying this food. And there in the midst of it was his son. And in horror, he went and he grabbed his son by the arm and dragged him out. He said, we don't have enough money to cover the food you've eaten, let alone any of this food here on the table. And the boy said to the father, the food was included in the price of the ticket. So for a week they had been eating this chunk of cheese and really almost starving to death when all the while there was this feast waiting for them. There are those of you out there who will be receiving First Communion. There are those who have received First Communion. Do you realize that there are some people who can receive the Eucharist and do not? It's free. It's here. It's part of the price of the ticket. And yet we do not take advantage. We're starving. And so... I encourage you today, boys and girls, when you receive the Eucharist with as much reverence and desire for something you have not yet been able to receive, that you keep that desire and you keep that reverence. That will require a certain amount of humility. There is a story about a monk and his disciples who are walking along the river. And the master sees in the river there is a scorpion that is drowning. So he reaches down and he picks up the scorpion to save its life and sets it on dry land. And the moment he pulls away, the scorpion stings him on the hand. And his disciples said, Master, do you want me to kill that wretched thing? And he said, why would you do that? It is the scorpion's nature to sting. And it is our nature to save. We cannot change that about ourselves. You know, last night we began talking about of humanity and the way in our humanity that we have to cut out some things from our life so we can actually hear God, so that we can begin to see ourselves as God sees us. And we're reflecting on Laudato Si. It's actually in the Ephesians, the canticle we just prayed. Praise be to you. Praise be to you, God. And in Laudato Si, the Holy Father writes this about our humanity. When we fail to acknowledge as part of reality the worth of a poor person, the worth of a human embryo, the worth of a person with disabilities, to offer just a few examples, it becomes difficult to hear the cry of nature itself. Everything is connected. There can be no renewal of our relationship with nature without a renewal of humanity itself. There can be no ecology without an adequate anthropology. When the human person is considered as simply one being among others, the product of chance or physical determinism, then our overall sense of responsibility wanes. And I think that we have certainly seen that. He goes on to say, learning to accept our body, to care for it, and to respect its fullest meaning is an essential element of any genuine human ecology. Also valuing one's own body in its femininity or masculinity is necessary 
if I am going to be able to recognize myself in an encounter with someone who is different. In this way, we can joyfully accept the specific gifts of another man or woman, the work of God the Creator, and find mutual enrichment. It is not a healthy attitude which would seek to cancel out our sexual difference because it no longer, sh no, it no longer knows how to confront it. And so he's essentially saying we're not created haphazardly that the divine artisan has a plan for us and the plan is in the theology of our bodies. There is a, a Jewish maxim that talks about this, that as we enter into eternity, our soul is created. We are preceded by choirs of angels who are shouting, here he is or here she is. They rein us in and bring us <laughs> to our inhabitants here on earth. And so how can we come to terms with our own humanity and the things that keep us from loving the way that God loves us? Well, I talked yesterday about one of the impediments to that, I think it's our electronics. So I wanna give you five suggestions tonight, and I didn't make these up, I stole them. And they are difficult to uphold. So I would not say try all five, maybe try one, maybe try two of them. The first is, for the first hour of our day, no electronics, no television, no radio, no phone, no checking in, no email, nothing. So if you get up at six in the morning, until seven o'clock, there is nothing, nothing. And people will say, well, what am I supposed to do for that hour? Well, you could kind of plan your day, maybe, Think about those people that you haven't reached out to in a while and you need to. Think about the major projects you have to do the, that particular day. But there's part two to this. For the last hour of the day, no electronics. No checking Twitter in bed. No putting out your last tweet or your Instagram or your Snapchat or whatever. No getting those emails that you read the one and now you can't sleep for the rest of the night. Even uh, you know researchers have said you shouldn't watch television in your room because the television sends the message of engagement. You want to be engaged, and so it's hard to sleep with that. So step one, for the first hour, last hour of the day, no electronics, TV, radio, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The second one, there is nothing more annoying than you are out with someone for a meal or you're engaged with someone and they keep doing this. Or they put it right on the table. Can you imagine if I got one of those old rotary phones and I went into a restaurant and went, there it is. It sends a very clear message that whoever is texting me right now is much more important than you. And you're right across from me. It says that this machine is much more important than you. And you're a person. Someone created you out of love for your own sake and I'm engaging with a status update. And so the second point is when you are engaging with a human, engage with them. Turn it off, shut it down, put it in a pocket somewhere. Do something with it so you can engage with a person. You'd be surprised how much life it brings. The third thing, once a month, maybe once a week, get off the grid totally. Don't answer the phone for the day. Don't check emails for the day. Don't go on the computer for the day. No phone, no radio, no. And you might say that's impossible, and maybe it is. I know when my brother goes on vacation with us, he answers emails and calls, and it's not really vacation when you think about it. But if you could have one day a month when you're totally off the grid, imagine this, I, I got to a place where I was outside of the parish and my phone broke. So for two days I had nothing. Imagine my surprise when I returned and the place was not totally destroyed. <laughs> that they actually functioned without me there. God forbid it. But it happens. It's not a lesson in how expendable we are. It's a lesson in how we can get away from things. Jesus was the Christ. 
and he spent time up on the mountain by himself. You might forget when Peter comes after him and says, Lord, where have you been? People are looking for you. They want to be healed. They want to hear. He's like, let's move on to the next town. I've had enough. I didn't come here for that. I came here to preach the gospel. And so if our Lord, who is God, needs a moment of rest, and he needs to commune with his Father, how much more do we need to do that? So first hour, last hour, cut it out. The second thing, to engage with someone when you're with them. The third thing, to get totally off the grid one day a week, one day a month. The fourth thing, go out to a coffee shop or some place and read a book. You know, a book with pages and it has a cover on either side. Sometimes they have pictures. It has that smell to it. You know, if I open up my nook or whatever, it doesn't smell like that. Open up a book, don't plug in, and listen to the people around you. Listen to life happening. And read the book. Finally, get outside and take a walk. Get out of the zone, out of the machine. Go out and take a walk. And again, pop the earbuds out. Listen to the world around you and what's going on. And if you live in the city like I do, get out of the city. Or stay in the city. Maybe you're one of those people who like city life. Whatever you need to do, get out and do that. If you do these five things, try for 30 days, your life will be transformed. Again, what do I do with all this spare time? You'll find time you never thought you had. This is when we find ourselves. Three years ago, I bagged my first deer. But there was nothing left after he hit the windshield. <laughs> and because I had to, go ahead, think about it a little bit first. <laughs> because I had to get a new car because of this deer, I decided from that moment on I was going after his whole family. <laughs> but what I came to discover sitting in that tree stand early in the morning or late at night, listening for the deer that I would never see, listening to the squirrels that were much louder than their bodies should make a sound, and the turkey who dragged their feet through the leaves like a herd, I also heard my heartbeat, and I could also hear God. Sometimes it's necessary to get out of the element and listen. And in that still voice, what our Lord says is, be humble, be merciful. Be humble and be merciful. Many will say that the root sin is pride. I don't think that is the root sin. I think the root sin is greed. Greed is wanting what we have no right to possess. Greed is wanting more than we already have. The evil one, Lucifer, it wasn't pride that killed him, it was greed. He wanted to be God. It was not enough to be second in charge. He wanted to be first. You will never hear Jesus say, money is the root of all evil. But he will say, love of money is the root of all evil. So greed goes far beyond what we need. And so tonight as we look at natura, of nature, the condition we're in, in our imbalance and our relationship with nature, has much to do with greed. Not possession, greed. Greed is when our possessions possess us. It's when we need so much more. And if we can look inside ourselves and we can look at the world as a whole and we can see humility and we can see the mercy of God, only then can we express that humility and mercy to others. Again, in Laudato Si, Francis says this, a sense of deep communion with the rest of nature cannot be real if our hearts lack tenderness, compassion, and concern for our fellow human beings. It is clearly inconsistent to combat trafficking in endangered species while remaining completely indifferent to human trafficking, unconcerned about the poor, or undertaking to destroy another human being 
deemed unwanted. The two are very much interconnected. And so in this greed, we now live in a throwaway society. Of all the species that have become extinct over the last 50 years, the one you did not hear about was the radio repairman or the television repairman because we don't use them anymore. When the television breaks, we get a new one. When the radio breaks, we get a new one. But what happens to all the old ones? They're not hand-me-downs in many cases. Where do they go? And so we have this throwaway mentality so much that it's not only with possessions, it's not only with food, it becomes as such with people. That if we do not want them, we get rid of them. It's easy. We do it with everything else. I remember my first week in the seminary, uh, I had a Ugandan, and it was his first week in the seminary there in the United States. And we, had, uh, we ate with the caf in the cafeteria with the college kids because we were there before the other seminarians came for an orientation. And I remember him, he ate very little at the, at the table, and then he looked like he was ill and he left. And I thought maybe he's homesick or maybe the food isn't to his liking or what have you. And so I, I spoke to him later and I said, what was the problem? And he said, what I saw the college children throwing in the trash can could feed my village back home. How I longed to take those trash bags to my village to feed my family and my friends. I could not believe it. And that totally changed my mentality about filling my plate and only eating half, or if I didn't like the taste of this, throwing it away. That we take for granted that we have this abundance, it's an overabundance, an overabundance, and it is greed that fuels that, much more than we need. So much so that often we don't eat because we're hungry, we eat, we eat because we can. Like ancient Rome, we eat for the taste. And there are so many who could benefit from our technology and our ability to produce. I remember being in grade school and how appalled I was to hear that some farmers are paid not to produce when there are many countries starving. And the Pope says this in his document. So this greed leads to a, a throwaway society. If we are humble and we are merciful, we realize that there are others who can use this. And if they can use this, we should use our resources to get them. And if we can't give it to them, at the very least, we should exercise temperance. We should eat just enough, not in an overabundance. I don't know if you remember that commercial from the 70s and 80s. You had that Native American chief. He's looking over the, the landfills and he has that tear coming down his eye. I wonder what he's doing today. You know, if he looked out and about. I saw a little meme about this. There was a, a woman talking to this other woman who was speaking in a foreign language. And she said, we're in America. So when you're in America, you speak English. And the woman said, I'm Navajo. I'm Native American. If you want to speak English, go back to England. <laughs> I thought, how true. We did not come to this country, many of us as immigrants, we came as conquerors. And they are the ones who are pushed to the margins. We have to remember that. In humility and mercy, that would never have happened. Even in the Catholic Church, some of the ways that we try to get the people to learn the faith by learning our language first, we did horrible damage to them. There were those who did it the right way, too, but we did do much damage. And so we have to remember that we want to share, we want to be generous to all those who do not have what we have. We talk about the quality of life, and Francis talks about the quality of life in Laudato Si. And he says, in a society where we can throw away so much, the definition of a quality of life becomes different. I have no quality of life because I can't play a game anymore. I have no quality of life because my, my thinking isn't as clear as it once was. 
You know, whereas I don't know about you, but some of the poorest people I've met are some of the happiest who may not have food, but they have a quality of life because they can love and they can communicate and they are within church or family. And so sometimes that can mar our perception. Viktor Frankl talks about a young man, he was paralyzed and uh, he never spoke. And finally his mother felt so bad for him and for her own condition that she decided to end his suffering and her own. But something happened. I don't know what went wrong, but something happened. And they were both there speaking with Viktor Frankl. And as they're discussing what went on and the mother's lamenting about the condition of their life, finally the boy spoke. He never spoke, and he spoke this time. And he said, I never wanted to die. Apparently his quality of life was not as bad as she thought it was. He never wanted to die. And yet, in our greed, we think we need certain things and things should be a certain way. We should have that power to make that decision that is only God's. We make the same mistake that Lucifer would make. And finally, in our greed, we need certain things. Well, we, we say we need them, we really want them. We have this desire for things, even when there is a cost associated with it. Francis talks about this, this consumerism, and what he says is, you know, a change in lifestyle could bring healthy pressure to bear on those who wield political, economic, and social power. This is what consumer movements accomplish by boycotting certain products. They prove successful in changing the way businesses operate, forcing them to consider their environmental footprint and their patterns of production. And so, you know, oftentimes we might talk about boycotting things in the church and people get kind of upset. You know, you can say, I will boycott this company because they do experimentation on animals and everybody lauds you. But if you boycott another because they support abortion, all of a sudden you're a radical, intolerant bigot. It's amazing how we kind of differentiate that way. Last night I spoke about, you know, out of Laudato Si, how he says we have to be careful that the scientific limitations we put to protect the animals and the environment also extend to humanity, which so often they do not. And so what can we learn? What is there to learn? The opposite of this greed is not necessarily generosity. It's humility. And this gospel tonight is so important. The rich young man approaches Jesus and he doesn't say, how can I get eternal life? What can I do to get it? He says, how can I inherit it? I don't want to do anything to get it. How can I just inherit it? How can you just give it to me? And Jesus goes through everything he needs to do. And he says, I've done all these things from my youth. So apparently it's not enough just to be a good person. And so he says to him, sell what you have, give the money to the poor, and come follow me. Notice he doesn't say, give what you have to the poor. Because I guess he could take it back. He says, I want you to make a complete commitment. Sell what you have, give the cash to the poor, and you'll never see it again. And then come follow me. Now it says in scripture he walked away sad. The word is stoinatso. And stoinatso doesn't mean sad. Stoinatso is used one other place in the Septuagint in the book of Esther. When Haman finds out he's going to be hanged. This is a sadness as though you have just lost your life. And so the, the rich young man doesn't walk away sad. He walks away as someone who has just lost his life. Someone who has been sentenced to death. And so it is. And so this was a scandal. When Jesus says it is more difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, that was scandalous. Because the rich didn't have to work. And they didn't have to worry about where their food or anything was going to come from. So they had all this spare time to be in communion with God. So that's the whole point. That we get so many things that we flood our lives with. 
We need so many things. But the most important thing, it's lost. Ask those people when they found God or when they reached beyond themselves. And it was usually in some sort of crisis where no matter how much money they had or position or power, that could no longer help them. Maybe they had some kind of illness or disease. Maybe they had a loss within their family. And none of those things we do to secure ourselves, none of those things could help them. So they only had one place to turn. And that made all the difference in the world. That is the lesson. That if we are humble and we are merciful, then we will realize that we have an obligation to our children and our children's children. The Pope calls it this intergenerational solidarity. It means we're not just going to get as rich as we can while we're here, despite the, the damage we're doing to the environment, and let our children and grandchildren think this stuff out. We have an obligation to them to take care of them and provide for them. So that begs the question, well, is there global warming or not? Do you want the answer? Do you? There's a guy, Pascal, and he made a wager. And this wager had to do with God. And he said, if I live my life as though there is no God, and then at the end of my life there is one, I'm in big trouble. But if I live my life as though there is a God, and then at the end of my life there isn't one, well, I've lived a pretty good life while I was here. And that's the wager I give to you. You can't tell me that over a hundred years putting carbon into the environment that it's not going to do something. But you think about this. If we live better as though this global warming is happening, if it makes us take care of the environment and ourselves so that we can be in this intergenerational solidarity, then who cares? We're doing what we should do anyway. If it is happening, then we're making strides to save the environment. If it's not, we're still making strides as we should to be good stewards of what God has entrusted to us. And it all works hand in hand. You know, if we have this humility and mercy, then we will feed the poor around us. We will take care of our own. We will take care of the animals that have been entrusted to us. We will be good stewards of the land and use the latest technologies to help us be more productive while not erring on the side of genetic manipulation. As one ethicist put it, we will learn to play God as God would play God. We learn to play God as God would play God. And God, when he does anything, has his people in mind, has his creatures and creation in mind. It all works together. And so you put the humanity with the nature and we come up with this dominion. Not domination, but dominion. And that's really what it's all about. In the end, especially as we celebrate this Eucharistic adoration, we realize that the land has provided the wheat and the grapes. That the work of mankind has formed the bread and the wine. And the Creator has taken it, blessed it, broken and given it as His very self.